Okay, we're going to talk about the uh, heat exchanger here. I'm trying to put in a bigger one, see if I can't make it better. This is the radiator and the Crossfire I've got, 2005 SRT. I took the uh, power steering lines and I modified them. I made them adjustable so that they go down instead of up. That way I got more clearance. As you can see now, the radiator has lots and lots of room here. Oodles here. And I'll be showing you the heat exchanger we're going to be putting in there. Uh, we also moved the horns up underneath of the vehicle so that they're down here underneath the headlight. A little extra light doesn't hurt. You can see what we've got there. The horns fit underneath of the frame. If I can get underneath you here, you can see that the bolts on the frame are perfect. I used the original horn nuts. No drilling required, so this is a neat little modification. I used the original length of the cable. So this is where we're going to be putting our uh, heat exchanger. I'm going to walk on back and uh, take a look at the history of heat exchangers here as we get going. Okay, went outside to a nice Virginia afternoon. This is the original heat exchanger, kind of wimpy looking. And it's got a tremendous amount of restriction, just tremendous amount. The holes inside the vent are so small that you can barely believe it. I don't think we can see inside there. We'll try to zoom in. These are microscopic holes. I'll turn it around so the sunlight can get in here. Uh, sorry for the camera work. Okay, those are just really small holes and they're not every other one. So that's that guy. This is the uh, heat exchanger I took off. That I used to have the lead heat exchanger. Massively thicker and bigger. Bigger is better, thicker is not. Because you want to have the air move through it to cool. This is my new and improved heat exchanger. Basically two transmission coolers uh, welded the frames together or tigged them together and then hooked up the copper pipes. The way this guy works is this is the feed and half the fluid goes up and half the fluid goes down. They're put in parallel so you have less restriction, more uh, water flow. And I said, well that's pretty good but I'm still only covering 75% of the available space to me. So number next, here we go. This is the heat exchanger best you can buy from Summit Racing. Basically what I did <clears throat> was I took off the inlet and the outlet horn. Let's see, this is the uh, inlet horn and this would be the outlet. It's got a radiator cap on it. It's a pretty cool radiator and it'll fit right up inside the car with almost no modifications. It's about an inch and three quarters thick. Pretty thin and it fits perfectly in the hole which I'll be showing in the next video. Try not to jump around so everybody doesn't get seasick. So that's what the heat exchangers all look like. You can see there's a tremendous difference between the original, the LET, the bigger one I made, which is almost two square feet, and this guy here, which has a massive number of rows. And they're one inch aluminum tube. And uh, like I said, it's about 170 bucks from Summit Racing. And that looks to be the least restrictive and the most uh, airflow possible through it, and also the most fluid through it. So I'm really expecting a real benefit. When I run the crossfire, um, I'm doing autocrossing. As a result, the uh, engine's running full power for as much as a minute at a crack, and it gets pretty hot. I've actually had the uh, BAS ESP light come on several times simply from the uh, engine going over temp and shutting down just because I'm doing 40 miles an hour at full power and I'm just not getting enough cooling. So that's where we stand. We'll get back to the video here in a little bit. Okay, here we are. I zoomed out as much as I can. <laughs> this is the car up on the lift. You can see above and below the bumper here as the car is sitting way up in the air. And there's lots and lots of air available. Now with the large grill that we've got, after cutting out all those little bumpers, we've got plenty of room for the radiator. Intercooler. And you can actually see there's room in here. This thing can rattle around. It can go left and right. It's just got gobs of room. And it appears that with a little careful planning, I can actually open the radiator cap without even having to fight it. It's going to be up just a little bit higher, about like that. But it all seems to measure out well. And then what I'm going to do is come over here, mark places in the uh, heat exchanger, and go ahead and TIG in some tubing so I can make the inlets and the outlets. And I'm not quite sure if I want to make an inlet in the top and an outlet at the bottom, or if I want to cut the radiator in the middle and put a blocking plate so it's a double radiator so it goes in one half down and then out the other but that's what we're doing engineering for we'll figure it out 
So that's what it looks like at this point. Like I said, there's still a lot of room in here. I mean, you can see there's a whole handful of room between the radiator and the body of the frame. So there's not going to be any kind of problems with their interference. The uh, radiator back here, if you look at it, you're still getting air back as much as you ever did before. This is the air conditioning radiator, and that, of course, is the engine radiator. So there's still plenty of air going around it. So um, besides the air that goes through it, you also got the air that's always been available to it from the sides. And it's just a really neat layout. <clears throat> Little measurements all I had to do to make it go. Sits down on the original rails, kind of like the LET did. So it's a, it's a good to go here. So we're all kind of set. Something for the weekend to do. Okay, well, this is the uh, radiator about an hour after I finished uh, the last video. We've got a uh, petcock hole we drilled out here. So we've got a petcock to drain it. Put a uh, tube on the outside here. A couple of little slips here to uh, hold the uh, radiator in. We use uh, wire ties to hold it down. Big black gorilla wire ties. This is going to be our return. And then a couple more wire ties on the other side to hold it down. That's worked really well in the back. You use a little foam to hold the thing so it's not touching the other radiator. And then you just put it down with some gorilla clamps. And that really holds the radiator quite securely. And we put these stubs on here. And that's some aluminum we got at a RV shop. Found it was a really cheap source of aluminum. Tigged it in there and uh, we're all good to go. Now all I have to do is just uh, drop that into the radiator over here. And uh, start tying it down. We can start piping it up. We can put the uh, water, sorry, the uh, power steering lines back down. Now, of course, yesterday I mentioned that I had taken the uh, lines and inverted them so that they gave me more room in the front. We'll see how that all looks. There's a reason I need more clearance in the front. So we'll get to that here in just a little bit. So this is the uh, day two. And tomorrow's Saturday, so we're going to have a chance to work on everything in one day. Bye. Okay, this is the radiator about an hour later. Got it mounted up in here. A couple of little points. I just used a couple of little wire ties here, the gorilla style, on some tabs I welded on the side. And then I used large diameter hose. I'm going to do a pressure check and I'm going to do a flow check. This is the diameter of the hose I'm using. This is the original. You can see there's quite a little difference. So uh, we're going to get a little more flow in here. And you can see how I've got it set up on my Johnson pump sitting over here on the side. has the uh, inlet just as short as it can get, so it's coming return from the radiator directly into the pump. That way it won't cavitate because we're sucking in the coldest water. The uh, pet cock